Welcome to the Seed Family Podcast, where we explore natural homeschooling, gentle parenting, simple living, and family adventure. I'm Rachel Rainbolt, the Sage Parenting Coach, coming to you from the Pacific Northwest, where I live wild and free in connection with my three wildlings and the papa bear in our fixer-upper on the beach. This is episode 66, and today I'm here with Dr. William Stixrud and Ned Johnson with a communication Q&A. Dr. Stixrud is a clinical neuropsychologist, lecturer, author, faculty member, and founder of the Stixrud Group. Ned Johnson is a tutor geek, author, speaker, and founder of Prep Matters. Together they wrote The Self-Driven Child and their new book, What Do You Say? So join us around the campfire and let's get living the family life of our dreams. today reading through thoughtful questions posted in the Sage Family Village and commenting with my heartfelt reflections and gosh that sacred space is just my favorite place on the internet. Did you know that every month we come together on a group coaching call where I talk through Q&As live and we all connect with each other in support? We affectionately refer to it as our monthly bonfire. If you want a sense of community and support on this gentle parenting journey, the Sage Family Village is where you want to be. Head over to sagefamily.com village and join us. Your friends are waiting. If you are enjoying the Sage Family podcast, then please scroll down and click those stars in your podcast app or on iTunes. Writing a review is a quick and easy way to support the show using the currency of feedback. Molly LPC writes, I'm new to homeschool. Rachel makes my road ahead seem not only manageable, but illuminates it in glowing forest dappled light. Whenever I struggle or feel plagued with doubt, she offers the wisdom I need. Her guests and the twists and turns of their conversations almost always alleviate my concerns and back my intuition up with science and experience. Molly, your words so beautifully articulate the intention I put behind every episode. So thank you. Bill and Ned joined me in episode 53, The Self-Driven Child, and it was one of my all-time favorite episodes. So they're back with the release of their new book, What Do You Say? How to Talk with Kids to Build Motivation, Stress Tolerance, and a Happy Home to walk through some examples of what to say when our kids are in some hard moments. Welcome back to the show, guys. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, it's really nice to be here. Can you briefly remind everyone who you are and what you're passionate about? So th- this is Bill, and uh, I'm, I'm a clinical neuropsychologist, and the last close to 40 years, I've made a living by testing kids who have learning disabilities or ADHD or autism or emotional problems, and I try to figure out what's going well, what's not going well, and how to help them. And I have two children and four grandchildren. I'm a rock and roll musician, and I'm passionate about meditation and yoga. Gosh, you're so cool. Okay, <laughs> Ned, how about you? <laughs> oh, I'm about I'm about half as cool. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> my uh, my 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 day job is I'm a test prep geek. I help kids prepare for and battle the alphabet of standardized tests to get into high school or college or graduate school. Uh, and I guess what I contribute to this is something like fifty thousand hours talking one on one with other people's kids. Uh, and, and through the whole process of preparing for this test, trying to figure out how to help kids be motivated and also how to manage stress under high stakes you know, situations. Having sort of two arms tied behind my back in that I can't use carrots or sticks because those aren't you know, arrows in my quiver, but trying to figure out how to use, use other tools uh, and ones we very much have tried to fold into this book that we have, What Do You Say? 
We need your brand of cool too, Ned. Don't worry. I have to say, <laughs> before, before, I even, cool. <laughs> before I even read The Self-Driven Child, I like read like kind of who wrote it and got to know you guys a little bit. And I thought, well, I don't know if I'm going to find value in this because I'm not a huge fan of standardized testing. Like what perspective is. is he bringing? And then I read it and it was like, oh, I get it now. Like I see like how valuable that is and how important that is, even for families like mine, where, you know, my kids weren't doing standardized tests all along the way. But still that that perspective that you bring from having that experience of helping kids who like you, a parent can't force them to do it mm -hmm. and they have to do the work themselves and they have to want to do the work themselves if they do. And I just, there's so much value in that perspective. So what a great pairing. Thank you guys for coming back together to create this new book and for coming back again to have a conversation with me about it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we, we enjoy talking with each other and when we enjoy talking with you too. <laughs> Okay, let's start with complaining. What do we say when our child is complaining? This was one of the things that like you guys talked a lot about in chapter one, and it's something that parents ask me a lot about. I think when our kids complain, we tend to try and almost like balance it out by leaning the opposite direction. Like if they say, oh, I, these shoes are so uncomfortable. You say, oh no, they're actually really comfortable shoes. And these are the ways in which they're comfortable. <laughs> and that tends to just write, like everybody kind of digs into their own camp. So talk to us about how we should be responding when our kids complain and why that doesn't work. Well, you know, what, what we thought about in, in writing this book about communicating with kids is ultimately, we, we, we want to communicate in a way that, that, that builds a strong connection with our kids. And so it, the more we thought about it, the more we studied it, the more we talked to each other about this and compared notes, it, it just seems that, that the keys really for developing a close relationship, these two important keys are expressive empathy and validating kids' feelings. And the empathy is the kids complaining about their shoes. It's, that, that sucks. I wouldn't want, you know, I, that, that, that sounds like you're, you're really uncomfortable. That's the empathy part. As opposed, and, and, and the validation is, boy, if my shoes were too small, I, they, they'd hurt too. And so we, we use these two tools of, of trying to reflect back what, what a kid is saying and so that that's respectful to the kid and models this kind of respectful listening. I'm trying to understand. I'm not judging. And I'm not trying to talk you out of your feelings. So we, we validate that I, I can see why you feel that way. But these two things, empathy and validation, seem to be really important keys for maintaining that kind of closeness we want with our kids, which, which we, we know that closeness to parents is as close to a silver bullet as you can get protect for protecting kids against stress. So that, that's the first thing I would say. Ned, what, what would you say, buddy? Well, yeah, and I would add to that. I can imagine people listening and saying, but, but, but aren't, they, aren't you just supporting them and wanting to, to, to have something to complain about? But what, what we're really trying to do is to help kids you know, reframe, help, the, help them um, think differently about what's going on. And as you mentioned just a moment ago, Rachel, we have a tendency to think, well, but these shoes are brand new and they're perfectly fine. <laughs> um, but when we argue that way, the, the thing that we're trying to get them to think, they resist thinking, mm -hmm. where if you can say, oh, gosh, that must be really frustrating if your shoes are uncomfortable when you, and, your, and your feet hurt. By con logic doesn't come hard emotions. Feeling listened to and understood does. And uh, would allow the kid to be in the position either to decide for themselves or maybe to hear from us. Well, maybe my shoes, maybe my shoes hurt because the, my feet hurt because the shoes are brand new and I just and I just have to break you know break them in. Um, and so, but, but by calming their emotions, um, by, by having them feel understood, it makes it much more likely that they can be flexible in their own thinking about the, the thing they're currently experiencing. Yeah, and, and, if they, and if that doesn't work, you just tell them to stuff it and, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, you think I had shoes? Right. <laughs> Barefoot, uphill in the snow both ways. Right. That's what my dad used to right. say. You had feet? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> we could afford feet back in my day anyway. Yeah. Yes, connection first. Like I, I always talk about this as the foundation of all my work, that connection first. Like before you speak, your, your words have to sort of run through this filter. Is this going to enhance the connection? Or like, is this going to move us closer together or farther apart? Because all language really, it does one or the other. And one of the pushbacks, pushes back, pushbacks mm -hmm. <laughs> that I get sometimes is um, people concerned that they are already so 
taxed and that this will be so much more work and time. And mm -hmm. they are always so pleasantly surprised when they find that it's true. When I, when I tell them that I don't want you to do any more, I actually want you to do less. And this results in less. It takes less time. It takes less energy. There's less upset. Everyone stays calm because if we say, oh, I'm uncomfortable. And someone says, oh, that must be so hard. Tell me about it. It, the whole interaction can take 60 seconds. Whereas if your kid says, I'm so uncomfortable and you say, no, you're not, then their amygdala is triggered and the mm -hmm. spite sort of goes back and forth all morning. So like, not only is this better for like long-term outcomes and it enhances your relationship, it helps them to get in touch with what they're feeling when they're feeling things. Um, it also just is so much easier guys. It's easier. <laughs> well, and it just makes it when kids feel respected and they feel understood, it just makes them so much more likely to go along with you, you know, yes. and, and, and not fight for their stuff. I mean, there are kids um, where they'll complain about stuff over and over again, you know, and I think that there are times when you when you say that, that um, you know, I, that I, I, I know that must be uncomfortable, but I, I'm not sure there's anything I can do about it. Or is, is there a way that I could help with this? Because there are kids and, and so we, we don't necessarily want kids to complain about the same thing over and over again. But I think when, when, they, when they have the habit of being listened to and being respected and, we, and, and being expressed in empathy and validation, they don't do that very much. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So. Yeah. And when they do, I'll, I'll share that one of my tricks where if I feel like a particular kid is complaining about something kind of over and over, I'll drop what I'm doing. I'll get right down at their eye level, give them like intense eye contact, lean all the way in and look so enraptured in what they're saying and I'll invite them to tell me all about it and I'll just mm -hmm. listen for as long as they talk and it might take like two minutes right like because they, they don't have all that much to say about it and then I'll say okay now I know thank you for telling me now I understand so you don't have to tell me again now I know that this is what's going on inside that, of you that, that's great mm. yeah it really just like calms that down it's like the box has been checked they know that I get it and we both can move on <laughs> <Love> <laughs> <it>. <laughs> Okay, so what do we say to a child who says, my history teacher gave me a bad grade on my paper? Like we might be thinking things about like responsibility and, and advice giving, but really how should we respond when they say something like that? Yeah, well, one of the things we talk about in the book is that as parents, we have, we have a writing reflex, right? Where we wanna correct the problem. And that, that tends to either be, start giving advice about how you should solve this or to try to talk kids out of those hard feelings. So be like, you know, well, well, well did you study? I mean, it didn't, it didn't look to me like you, you know, you were, you started practicing studying early enough or, or did you even talk to your teacher about this? And we start giving all this advice or, you know, say, well, you know, it's not that big a deal, sweetheart. You know, it's, it's only one B. I'm sure you can do better next time. But again, as you mentioned before, Rachel, we, that misses the opportunity to emphasize the connection where if we go right back to what we talked about of, of oh, gosh, that must be awfully frustrating to, to get a bad grade. Can you, can you tell me more about that? You know, then we, then we kind of open the door of that empathy and validation. And if when they feel heard, then you say, well, can you think of something that would, would have would have made any difference here? Can you think of what might be a good a good next step? Because because I know you work it's, you sure it sure sounds like you work pretty hard on that and you're pretty upset about that. You know what do you think would help? Mm -hmm. And again, it gets us out of the position of one having to come up with the solutions ourselves, and because it's so much better for kids to come up with these solutions for themselves. And also, we've all had the experience of giving really good advice about what they might do going forward. And kids feel like we are criticizing them or attacking them. And then they get defensive and start to reflexively disregard or reject the very thing that could help them. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I think, to, oh, go, ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, 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 I was just gonna say that I think when, you know, so often, you know, kids will make excuses for things and we know that they're kind of making an excuse. And rather than saying, rather than calling them on it, if we just kind of validate the, the feeling, they're just much more likely to say, well, you know, I didn't study very hard. I think I need to study harder next time. I mean, that we mm -hmm. certainly, as Ned said, yeah. we could say, is there a way that I could help? But so often when they feel heard, they're much more likely to admit, to, you know, that we, and, we, and, and, and we don't have to call them out, uh, which, which really helps not only a relationship, but it just helps them kind of be honest with themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and realize that it's safe to be honest with themselves. 
Yeah, they can't take responsibility if they are feeling attacked because then they have their wall up. Like they have to sort of defend themselves and you can't, it's too hard to defend yourself while, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. in that and take responsibility at at the same time. So I love all the things you're saying. Again, it's about like kind of positioning yourself as an ally where if you're on the same side, there's just, there's so much more like safe space to, to look at what you could have done differently or what things you learn from the situation. Like, that's something I often talk with my kids about, like, you know, oh, that sounds like, you know, that you didn't get the grade that you were hoping for. Like, gosh, that's so hard. I like the teacher was not, you, you didn't have the tester that you were hoping you were going to get, man, what a bummer. Like, did you learn anything from this situation that might help you next time? Like I, no, I'm honestly asking, like, I don't have any ideas cause I've not taken this test before, you know, like mm-hmm. tell me about it. So it like, it's like, there's no blame. I think one thing too, that I, that it is helpful for me to remind myself regularly and helpful probably for other parents too, is to remind yourself that, um, that this is their journey. Like, it's not me. Like, it's something that I have to remind myself often. Like, it's not me. Like I didn't get a bad grade on this test. Mm -hmm. This isn't my, you know, whatever the thing is, sometimes parents, you know, their, their ego gets so invested in what their kid is going through. So when their kid says like, oh, my history teacher gave me a bad grade, they have all these reactions about what they would do differently. And, and, you know, they feel triggered and defensive and all that around it. So sometimes for me, I find it helpful just to have that simple reminder of like, this didn't happen. This didn't happen to me. You know, like this, this is hers to own. It's not mine to own. Really. That's why I say this is hers to own. So I can be clear on like, what's mine to own and what's hers. What's mine is not to study for this test or get a good grade on this test, or even to take this class. Like what's mine to own is just to be like a safe Harbor of unconditional love for her to bring her mistakes to, or his mistakes to, and to be a sounding board maybe, you know, but, but just. Well, I think that's such a great point. And one of the things that I I think is really worth emphasizing is that if we jump into the, what you you could have, should have, would have kind of thing, and we make ourselves not a safe Harbor, then kids won't bring problems to us because they are worried about are, are, are fearful of the emotional backlash, or even just that they don't want to make mom and dad upset. Yeah. And then they don't bring problems to us. And there's a, there's a really wonderful story in, uh, in, the, in the, w- the second book, What Do You Say?, where my, my son, who's now a sophomore in college, was a sophomore in high school, and he had a party. Um, it, was, it was a school dance, and he got invited to like a, an actual high school party, like first time ever to the party after the dance kind of thing. And where he's out with a walk with, with my wife and me, and he stops and asks, he said, I got a question. I'm like, what's your question? And he dawdles for a minute. He says, well, what do I do if people are drinking alcohol there? Now, it's a really vulnerable question. Alcohol, you're not going to that party. And we just <laughs> shut down his social life before it ever began. We had this really great conversation about, well, kind of role-playing in this situation, that situation. What finally came out was he'd heard this kind of cautionary tale from one of his friends about a, a high school party where a bunch of kids are drinking. One kid got really, really, really sick. The cops were called. As the cops show up, everyone you know scatters like roaches and with the light turned on, <laughs> except for this one kid who's super sick and another kid who stopped to help her. And so this kid who stayed behind to help her, she's the one, and even though she's not drinking herself, she gets a $500 citation for being there. And so the way my, Matthew's, my son's friend told the story is, don't be there because you'll get in trouble, mm-hmm. even, if there's, even if you're not doing anything wrong, if you're there where the alcohol is. And I said, well, gosh, yeah, that sounds pretty in, intense. I said, you know, I feel, I feel awfully rough for her. I said, but I, I do think there might be another way to look at this. And he kind of cocks his head and he says, well, I said, well, it's possible. You, you could make an argument that that girl who stayed behind to help, she also had got stuck with a $500 fee, but she paid 500 bucks to save the life of someone else's kid. Mm-hmm. And it was so fun. And what really did, I mean, one, we got that lesson. And, but two, it really gave my, our son the sense that you can come and talk to us about things and we're not going to blow to pieces. We're not going to shut things down. We're going to treat you respectfully, express our concerns and talk through this. And, you know, because now he's off to college with 
you know, far away with suitcases full yeah. of our money, right? And, 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 the, and the issues are a lot more troubling than, than yeah. getting a bad grade on a, on a history test. But from our perspective, we really planted the seeds of, of, of opening the door and creating this relationship to having these kind of much more difficult but more meaningful conversations because when he would get a 52 on a, on a, on a history test in seventh grade because he studied the wrong test, studied the wrong chapter, we didn't go to pieces. We really took this, this, this very consultative approach you know, of asking questions without judging and without telling him what to do. Yes. Oh. <laughs> And it seems to me that, the, that what you're doing is, is remembering, that it just as what Rachel is saying, this is his life. Mm-hmm. And at the be- beginning of the book, you know, we, we said, at least I, I personally kind of organized my thinking uh, mm-hmm. around, about what's a parent's role around three questions. Whose life is it? Whose, whose responsibility is it? And whose problem is it? And I, and I, I want my, my, my job, I think, is to help my kids figure out who they want to be, what kind of life they want, because ultimately it's their life. My, my, my job is, is to help them where I can, but not re- take responsibility for what's really their responsibility. And my job is to, is to support them to solve problems, but not solve them for them, because it, it, it's by solving your own problems that you develop high stress tolerance and resilience. Yes, yes. And, and going in for that control can sometimes soothe our own anxiety, but it denies them the opportunity <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. To, <laughs> to learn all this stuff on their own. So rather than just saying, you're not going to that party, like that might make us feel good. Like not, not good necessarily, but it calms our anxiety for sure. I know you guys even mentioned so like a study in the book about that, but it deprives mm-hmm. your kid of learning how to, of having that conversation with you to actually learn how to navigate possible things that could come up, which is really what the goal of parenting is. Well, that's the, that's the crazy thing because the way you develop, you know, th- that ability to handle social situation is by handling them and then yes. developing the confidence. I, I I got through that. I didn't die. I didn't fall apart. I got through it. You know, and then, yeah. then you, it just it increased that sense of control, that ability to handle new situations. And, and as the stress scientists say, that sense of control that I can handle this, it, it inoculates you from the harmful effects of stress. Yes. Yes. So what do we say if a child is asking if they can do something? Like, how can we get around that knee jerk? No, like, can I go to that party or or even with littler kids, you know, things that are smaller, how do we get around that knee jerk? No. One of the really interesting things we learned, Rachel, in in kind of researching for this book is that if if, if a child or an adult is lying in in a a, uh, function, in an MR scan or functional MRI, and they just hear the word no. You see, they, they get all the, this big cascading of, of stress, the activation in the stress centers of the brain. You see this physiologically, you see this in, in uh, increases in stress hormones, just hearing the word no. And it, it, it turns out that positive words like love, kindness, they don't have as much effect on kids as, as, as negative words. I mean, they say that negative is more powerful than positive. So ideally, and then we talk about John Gottman, who's, who studied the expert on, on marriage and relationships, who studied successful marriages and said they really have a five to one ratio between positive interactions and, and, and negative. And ideally, we want to be thinking, how do we use positive language? So in answer to your question, I mean, one way of thinking about if a child is just, um, is if we can't say yes, say, I need time to think about that. Let, 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 let's talk about, let, let me, let me, help me understand the, the situation here. Let's talk about the pros and cons. But I, I, but I think that you, your point about not going knee jerk to no is, is, is really, because the more kids hear no, and a lot of kids hear no, 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 no. And it's really stressful. Yeah, it's stressful. And then, and they, then, and then you then become yes. wallpaper and they tune you out. <laughs> like they right. stop coming to you. They'll just try and find ways to do it by going around you. Right, right. And well, I, I think, oh, go ahead. I was thinking, and I was going to say, you know, if we talk about the book and say, well, you know, I really want to say yes to this. Can let's talk this through, mm-hmm. because in a perfect world, you know, if if we as the parents think this is really not what we should be doing, this is really not a good idea, we have good reasons to think that. And what we're trying to do is to help get our kids to to see those in the same way. So if you say, well, let's let's go through this and and and, and pro con this and talk through it holding open the possibility that we might also be wrong. There might be something that we've not, we've not thought about it, but, but ultimately th- there aren't that many things that are a hundred percent. This is the right way. And, and hundred percent, that's the wrong way. Most things are in between. 
And we want, we want to work with the kids. We really we're big fans of collaborative problem solving because it keeps us mm -hmm. on the same team, even though we don't agree all the time. And when kids are making decisions for themselves, they also have to weigh the same way that we do the pros and cons. It's not very few things are, are black and white. And so when we can take, oh gosh, I really, I really want to say yes to that, but I have some concerns. Can we talk through that? And maybe your kids, some, I mean, gosh, knows my kids have surprised me coming up with a solution that I, I thought I, I had all the answers. And Obviously, I don't because I'm, you know, human like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds fun. Let's think about, oh, uh -huh. let's think about how we could make that happen. Like, that's something yeah, yeah. I said a lot yeah. when they were little, like, oh, that sounds like fun. Let's think about how we could make that happen. And it was a lot of like logistical conversations, you know, so it would be like, okay, yeah, so yeah, we yeah. have a dentist appointment at three and then so-and-so is coming over to play at this time. Like, do you have any ideas about how we could make it? Well, maybe could we do it tomorrow? Like, okay, let's check tomorrow. So it's, I found that when they were younger, it was more logistical. And then as they got older, it became more what's your concern? Like the conversation mm -hmm. centered around mm -hmm. that a lot. Like my teenager just asked, like, can I spend a week down in Portland with some friends, but her parents are going to be out of town. I know that I'm sure <laughs> I, I, can, I can, I can anticipate a lot of like concerns that you would have about that. So can we talk about what those concerns might be? And we can see if we can work out like a plan that addresses them and that we can both feel good about. Those are like literally the words she said to me. So wow. it's, it's hard. First of all, like sometimes I want to be a bit immature and be like, can't you just like throw a tantrum and then I can just be like, no, you know. <laughs> but also it's like one of my biggest, like I feel it's one of those like rewarding parenting moments that that even before she comes to to the com to like to the point of inviting me into the conversation, she's already thinking about on mm. her own, like where could the safety concerns be? What if this happens, what could I do? And she's already like working out those plans, you know with her friends and the people involved, you know, both sort of like right off the bat as the plans are forming, which, oh, which so ultimately good. is the goal, right? Like, that's exactly what I want for her to be able to do that when I'm no longer that last step in the process to get like the final okay or some logistical support or whatever it is. You're a good mother, Rachel. Ray. <laughs> <laughs> I love Thank it. You. Thank you. That's so nice. <laughs> well, you know, and one of the things that Bill and I've been talking about the past, you know, few weeks here, as we've been talking about this book a lot, is to remind ourselves and other people that if everything goes the way it should, we will have relationships with our children as adults longer than we had relationships with our, as our children as children. Yes. Right? And so the way that you just described that it's so respectful and it's really laying the groundwork for, you know, when she's 26 and she, you know, she, you, you were expecting that she was going to come home from Thanksgiving, but she's got other plans. And how do you, how do you figure out, you know, a plan B that everyone can feel okay with without, you know, because there's, gosh, there was just, there was a, a piece by David Brooks in the New York times a couple of weeks ago about some shocking percent, what was it, Bill, like 27% of, of, mm -hmm, of people mm -hmm. who are estranged from, from someone in their family, typically, typically an adult, typically mm -hmm. a parent. And you thought, oh my goodness. I mean, all the unhappiness inv involved in that. And, and a big part of it was just these, these, these people describing having too, too many experiences where their parents are telling them what to do all the time and not treating mm -hmm. them respectfully. And gosh, let's, let's set this, let's, let, let's plant the seeds for a, a healthy, mature adult to adult relationship. Let's start that as early as we can. Yes. That's, that's I, I had a conversation with my husband at one point, like as my oldest was sort of transitioning, you know, into this kind of launching phase where I remember saying the words, like the dynamic that we put in place right now determines the the dynamic that we're going to have for the rest of, of her entire adult life. Like, cause mm -hmm. this is our sort of our final, you know, the, the final season in like the more active parenting role, like the final part of her childhood where she's living with us. So mm -hmm. this, this season of parenting, we have to be so intentional about, about transitioning in a way that still maintains all that respectful stuff that we've done all along, but also loosens the rain more mm -hmm. like, a, and in a very natural way, like gives over more of the control. And, and yes. And, and I want to add that, you know, for, for parents who, you know, who haven't done it this way, you know, who, who said, no, that, 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 that no way, done a lot of that, but we, we both think, that apologize, once we realize maybe it, there's another way to do this or a better way to do this, apologizing to the kid and say, you know, I, I used to think that if you asked me to do something and I didn't initially see how it could work, 
I, uh, my job is to say, no, I'm sorry. Now I, I've been thinking about this more. I've been reading some stuff and I realized that if you, if you, if you want to do something, I, I, I want to just, I want to be better about just kind of really listening and thinking it through with you but, and see whether we can find a way to make it work. Um, and I just, just think so, so often that, that you know, <laughs> men and I have, have lectured, you know, hundreds of times about the subject and child and, 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 and frequently or not, not infrequently, somebody will after the first 10 minutes will raise their hand and you ought to say, what if I already screwed up my kid? <laughs> Is it too late? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think that this, uh, when we realize that there's maybe a better way to do it, apologize. You know, I used to think that I had to do it this way, but I'm realizing that, that I, I can be more flexible about this. It really, yes. kid, when we do that, kids feel so respected. Yes, absolutely they do. One of my favorite things too to point out kind of about like gentle, respectful parenting is that it's really not about parenting. It's just about being in like human relationship. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. like, as I explained it to one of to my, like my, one of my kids who was just transitioning into being a teenager, like when you come to me and say like, Hey, this opportunity came up, like, what do you think about it? What are your thoughts? What are your concerns? Like, that's, that's the same thing that I do like with my husband, like where I, if I say, Hey, I got invited to speak at this conference, like, what do you think about it? Like, do you have any thoughts? Do you have any concerns? Like he'll, you know, when we live that that's what it is to like be in a family and to care about another human being and to con be considerate of their needs and, and concerned about their well being, And we all sort of affect each other. So when my kids can see too, that that's, that's how I relate like to the other grownups, like in the system and in our world as well. I, I find that that too is like this extra shot of like, respectfulness and it can help if you're coming to the game late like for kids to see or to sort of explain like oh I, I've been learning that like my relationships are so much better if I can make this shift like how does it feel when I say it like this and I, I find that it just gets it can sometimes help a parent and child break out of like a dynamic that's been really skewed on the power scale for a while to just yeah. talk about it in terms of like human relationships. That's such a beautiful point, and you know, many people have made the point that, that we often talk to children in ways that we just wouldn't talk to anybody else, yeah. you know, yeah. to, to our own kids, you know, get out of here. You know, yeah. The people we love the most with less respect than we give to anyone else. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so, so I, I think- Great that, formula. That, and, and, and many of us think, well, we shouldn't have to talk to our kids. Well, you know, if, if we want them to, to be respectful to other people, the best thing we can do is treat them respectfully. And so it just, it just makes sense to, um, to think, to think about our kids as, as, as precious, <laughs> precious human beings and relate to them in, in, in an age-appropriate way, in a, a way that's kind and respectful while still maintaining our natural authority is, is because we're, 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 we're older and we're wiser and have more experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we can still have like boundaries and our we Absolutely. can bring our own needs to the relationship too. Like I love that the way we're talking about this sort of holds space for all of that stuff. Right. Okay, what do we say to a kid struggling with a hard new skill or a problem? Maybe, maybe saying something like, oh, I'm so stupid. Well, I mean, again, validating that feeling um, and not trying to talk kids out of it. Or, or you know, so, so something like, you know, boy, you sound, you sure look pretty frustrated by that. I, 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 I'd, I'd feel upset too if I, if I, if I felt like I was, I, when, when I feel stupid because something's hard for me. And the tendency is to want to say, oh, sweetheart, you're not stupid. That's not true at all. Or, you know, you're smart at so much other any things or, you know, everybody finds this hard. And, it, and it's a way of, from my perspective, it can give kids the message that I don't want to hear your hard feelings, right? Mm. That, that I can't kind of hang with them. I remember, so my, my, my wife teaches Latin and my daughter, <laughs> our daughter, who's now a senior in high school, is just, I mean, she's, she's got at least 20 IQ points on me and she's, she's just got a really <laughs> fine mind. Um, but she also, you know, for years for, you know, for, she's for a few years, this was a few years ago, would get frustrated really easily. And she was came home with some assignment in Latin and she's like, I can't do this. It's just, this is just, this is just impossible. And my wife is hearing this and one is thinking that, that, that one, there's no way that's possible because you are far and away had find this easier than anyone else in your whole, in your whole grade of natural whole school. It's just the kind of brain that she was lucky enough to have. And if you do need help, well, you, you kind of got a resident expert here, right? And so my wife starts <laughs> trying to talk her out of it. And I, of course, know nothing about Latin. So, so, I, so which means I'm really helpful in this situation by saying, 
golly, boy, you, you look really frustrated by that. Is there is the way that I can help? And mm. it had nothing to do with a Latin, right? If, and of course yeah. she could do it, but she was really spun up about something. And so I took seriously, you know, and, and this isn't to give my wife a hard time at all. It's just that she fell into that writing reflex that we all have of wanting to fix the thing or to help my daughter feel better. And I just, you know, watching my wife give advice and go, that didn't work. Oh, mm, let me try this instead. <laughs> and to say, my gosh, you seem so frustrated by this. Can you tell me what's going on? And then she just laid it all out. And, and we talk about um, this wonderful guy named Iran McGinn who uses reflexive, teaches reflective listening with the acronym of wigging, which is what I got is. And you just kind of repeat back, boy, you seem really frustrated. By it. So what you're telling me is, is, is you, 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 you've got this huge assignment um, and, you're the inst- and the teacher didn't make the instructions very, very clear at all. And you don't know how you're going to get it done. Do I have that about right? Mm. Because feeling listened to and understood, that's what calms hard emotions. And as what happened with my daughter, as it always happens with my daughter, as soon as that happens, within about seven minutes, she's figured out the solution, maybe seven seconds. And then I swear to gosh, 25 minutes later, this overwhelming thing is done. Because she, <laughs> she, I mean, she, you know, like a lot of kids, she has a brain that works really fast, but she can also get herself stuck. And yeah. so this validation got her unstuck. I had nothing to contribute to Latin, but I could just, just a little bit of empathy and validation and reflective listening got her unstuck. Yeah. I'll, think- uh, go ahead. I'll, I'll mention too, Rachel, that um, it, it, in the chapter on, uh, in, our, in our new book about motivation, talking with kids that got to build motivation, that we talk about uh, the, the, the mind, uh, Carol Dweck's work on mindset theory and, and, and with the idea and the, the caution to not to tell kids that they're smart because it reinforces, kind of can reinforce the fixed mindset. And for me, I mean, I, 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 the last th- almost 40 years, I, I've, I, I've been telling kids, you know, you're a pretty smart kid. Because in part, because so many kids that I see who have learning disabilities or ADHD, they think they're stupid. Mm-hmm. And so the, I, I feel what, what, I, what I tell kids is, is that they're, you're, you're smart enough. You're smart enough. And initially, if they're saying you're stupid, I'm not, I'm not good at this. I don't, like, like Ned was saying, I don't try to talk them out of it. If it's something that persists, what I say is that I can't take that I can't take that idea away from you, but I see it really differently. If you'd like to hear my angle, I'm happy to share my angle with you. And then what I say is that 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 I, I'm, I'm, there's, there's people who are smarter than you. People who are smarter than me. I, I, I'm, I thank God for the people in my field who are smarter than me because they make up tests, they make up theories that I get to use. But I'm smart enough to do something interesting, and you are too. I, I'm doing something really interesting and, and useful. You are to, you're smart enough to, to do something useful in this world. But I, I, I don't, I, I've seen so many kids over the years, the parents say, I keep telling, I keep telling me he's smart. But he's, and, and the kid, so, and that kind of dance, you know, we don't want to participate in that kind of dance. That's why I say, you know, that I, I can't take this away from you. Uh, and so I want to change the energy. So I'm not, I'm not trying to force you know, my, my view, but I say, I got, an, I, got, I got another way of looking at it. You, you want to hear it. And they invariably do. Gosh, that's beautiful. I love one of my favorite quotes in the book too, is how you say, how can I use my strengths to do good in this world? Like, it's not Mm -hmm. so much about like, are you smarter? Are you not? It's that we all are smart enough or talented enough in some way. We all have some strengths such that like we have a place in this world and have a purpose and can do good. Like, can that just be the message for, for everyone? Well, well, it's such a good point because, you know, if you, if you spend your time constantly looking around and say, am, are, 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 am I as smart as other people? Are there other people who are smarter than I am? Yeah. Of course, you're going to find people who either are or, or you perceive to be smarter. And so, you're, so effectively, you're constantly looking for things that are threatening to yourself. Mm. As opposed to what are my strengths and how can I contribute? Are there ways to have strengths? Everyone has strengths. Are there ways to contribute? There are always ways to contribute. Yeah. And so it's a little bit like, you know, practicing a glass half full, you know, mindset as opposed to glass half empty. 
Mm -hmm. One of the things you say in chapter four, too, about like, it's true that you haven't yet. Like, I definitely have found that one helpful. Like if my kid's trying to ride a bike and keeps falling, you know, oh, I'll never ride a bike. Like, oh, that gosh, it must be so frustrating to work so hard and to know that you haven't gotten it yet. Like just that word yet. I love how mm -hmm. you guys pointed that out because I find mm -hmm. it, I too find it to be so powerful. Yeah. Okay. What do we say to a teenager whose life is being negatively affected by something like marijuana use? This is a heavy one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we have a great story about them. Do you want to tell that story, Bill? Well, I'll, I, what I'll mention is, is yeah. that um, it, it, there's, there's a chapter in our book. It, it's called um, the language and silence of change. And it focuses on what, what do we know about how people change? And what, what, what everybody says is you can't change somebody else against their will unless they're asking you to, to, to help them change. Because then if you do, what you get is you, you get pushback and, and you get people who are basically resist um, probably doing what's in their own best interest. And part of the idea is that uh, we talk about something called motivational interviewing, uh, which is developed initially to, to work with people who are problem drinkers, but it's been, uh, it's a way of communicating, a way of uh, discussing things with people that can allow them to, to discover their own reasons for change. And it's based on partly on this idea that we're all ambivalent about, or usually we're ambivalent about change. You know, if, if I'm not a very good student, it's not lost on me that, that there may be advantages to doing better in school, but I may also have had the experience many times of trying to do better, but just couldn't. So I had this kind of this push pull in my own head where I want to do better, but, but I'm not sure I can. And the more people say, you need to do better, you need to do better, the more I cling to it, but I can't, it's too hard for me, that kind of thing. So well, yeah. what we want to do is, is in, in the case of marijuana use, and this is really hard for parents, ideally, we seek first to understand. We, 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 that we come back to the listening and the empathy. And Ned, tell the story about the girl the, 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 in the book. Yeah, this, I love how you frame that up, Bill. Um, th there's a friend of ours who's a school counselor, uh, the, the girl who had been coming to talk with her, and she was smoking a lot of pot. And our friend said to this girl, well, look, I'm not going to try to talk you out of this. I'm not going to be the umpteenth adult to tell you the reasons why you should may have some concerns about this, because I know you're smart enough to understand those. But I am curious. I'd, I'd love to know more about, I'd love to learn more about your relationship with pot. And the girl, well, you know, sort of not, not being, being forced, starts talking about how, well, it makes her feel more relaxed. And she likes the kids that she hangs out with when she's smoking. She just feels cooler, you know, so on and so forth. <clears throat> and, and she keeps listening. And the, our friend keeps listening and validating that and repeating it back. And eventually the girl says, it, it is kind of expensive, though. <laughs> and so this idea of motivational interviewing, you're looking for change talk. Now, what you don't do this is pounce on, well, see there, if you would stop, you know, you said, well, she said, well, she could keep, well, so, well, so tell me more about that. Well, you know, I buy, I buy twice a week because we, we smoke pretty much every day. Um, and it is kind of expensive. Well, if you had money, if, if you only smoked once, so if you had more money, what would you do with it? Oh, you know, I'd, I'd probably get my hair done. I haven't had my hair cut in a while. My friend's got this really neat pair of shoes and I'd love to get one of those. She said, oh, well, that's an interesting, interesting idea. And again, doesn't lean on one side of the scale lest the girl land on the other. Right. And she you know, sees her a couple, three weeks later and she has her hair done. <laughs> and again, very gently, she said, well, your hair looks cute. T tell me about that. Oh yeah, well, I decided last week I, I might just smoke once and I got my hair done. Did you like it? And it's, it's, it takes a lot of energy not to put more energy into the system, right? But to yeah. just to, because, and the idea behind motivational interviewing is, is simply this, that hearing ourselves articulate our own reasons to change, so much more powerful than having other people tell us the reasons to change, in part because we, we will resist other people's words because it makes us feel defensive. Yeah. And when, when we hear them ourselves, they're powerful in ways and, and, and oftentimes safe in a way that we know, we know this person doesn't have an ulterior motive. Um, and, but as Bill points out, it's hard, it's hard to do this. And this is why so often we remind ourselves that, that the concerned adults outside of the nuclear family are often the ones who can help move kids. And so, so parents so often think if I don't get him to change, I don't get her to change, she's, she's screwed. And that's really not the case because a lot of times it's people outside of the family. So, so when we were writing this book, we talked with dozens and dozens of teenagers. And one of the questions that we would ask is, who do you feel closest to in the world? 
And sometimes it was my mom, sometimes my dad, sometimes an older sister, a cousin, an aunt, an uncle, my soccer coach, piano teacher, whatever. And the question then was, well, so what, what makes you feel close to those people or to that person? And it was two things. One, they listen without judging me. And they don't, they're not always telling me what I should be doing. Hmm. Oh, so much brilliant. I'm like nodding enthusiastically, but I recognize <laughs> that the podcasting audience can't see that happen. So everyone just know I'm nodding enthusiastically. Yeah, the motivational interviewing, oh, brilliant. And I really wanted to use this example because it's one where people say like, oh, well, yeah, but you know, mm -hmm. all of this, like, you know, letting them own their own lives thing. Yeah. It's great. Respectful parenting, blah, blah, blah. But <laughs> when something big comes along, then you've got to just throw it all out the window. Right. Right. And so I love that you included this example in the book and that you guys are willing to dive into it with me today. I feel right. like it's so helpful. And, and I'll mention that, that this spring, I was working with a family where the 15 year old is smoking a lot of pot. And I sent, I sent the mother a draft copy of this, of this chapter we're talking about. And she, she, she just tried it instead of, no, no way, but you know, I'm not, you know, this is not acceptable, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. she, just, she just listened and talked about what, what do you get at? And it really had to do with, with, with treating social anxiety, really mm -hmm. lowering your social mm -hmm. anxiety. And she said, I just listened. And, and, um, and that uh, we had a couple of conversations about it, helping to, to, to understand. And she said, he, he just, I, you know, that we talked about, are there other ways you consider to treat social anxiety? Mm -hmm. Dr. Dr. Stixter, you know, suggested therapy and, and, and he stopped smoking and he, and he went into therapy. And actually, actually, I think he learned to meditate as well. Um, but um, it, it, the, 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 the I mean, it is true that there are some kids, if, if they're really, if they're using excessively, we, we think they have a really problem with, with that we, we need to get professional Happen. help. Mm -hmm. But 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 I did that that the point is that even even something like using drugs, that if our first response can be to try to understand rather than just reflexively, based being because it makes us stressed, kind of reflexively jumping on the kid, we're more we can be more helpful in helping the kids solve the problem. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, and I, I just. And I was, Go if I was going to jump really quick, I, I um, had the opportunity to have a conversation a couple months ago with Jessica Leahy, whose new book is The Addiction Inoculation. I listened to your podcast episode. Oh, did you? Oh my gosh, <laughs> she's just wonderful. And yeah. just in just the you know, in, in many ways, um, substance use disorders are oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes born out of people having too much stress in their life and not having healthy ways to relieve stress. They use, so they use unhealthy ways, including, you know, um, mm -hmm. drinking alcohol and, and smoking drug and, and, and drug use to, to manage that stress response. And so oftentimes it's when people are, 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 when things are going the worst that we feel like we need to come down on the kids. But oftentimes it's when things are going the worst that that, co that close connection to mom or dad matters most. Yeah. Yes. And, it, and it's just interesting in this context, Rachel, that one of the most surprising things that I learned some years ago was at, 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 was um, how much what what, what um, how much risk that people from affluent families who go to high achieving schools are mm. at higher risk mm. than middle class people or even kids in poverty for anxiety, depression and substance use. And this work has followed young adults from high achieving schools into young adulthood into the kind of mid twenties, and even mid twenties, there are much higher uh, incidents of substance use disorders. And the people doing this research say, why is it these kids who seem to have everything, they have so many advantages, why is it that they're so they're so vulnerable to these stress related problems? The the, the two explanations are excessive pressure to excel, and not feeling close to your parents. Mm -hmm. And that's it, which is why it, what we're talking about here is just so important. And, and we, we just, I mean, all of us, we're just we just do the best we can, you know, and kids yeah. don't need perfect parents. We don't need to be connected to it 24 seven. We don't have to be our kids. We don't want to be our kids' best friend uh, while they're growing up as adults, maybe a little story, different story, but as their kids, we don't want to be the best friend, we want to be the parents. But ideally, we, we work to, to, to take this kind of respectful relationship with kids because it really does have this tremendous protecting, uh, protective effect, particularly on, on, on kids who have a lot of advantages. Yes, yes. And to have that, 
to when kids are young, particularly in my audience and the kind of parenting that they do, mm. we are often talking about like behavior is communication about an unmet need. And I, and a lot of people have a hard time like extending that as, as their kids get older. And so everything you've just shared, I just want to highlight how it's a perfect example of, of that conversation of unmet needs. Like how is this, this behavior, this choice, this, whatever it is, how is it serving them? Like if, if we're doing it, it's, it's helping us in some way, it's helping us cope. It's giving us relief. It's, you know, what, whatever it is. So we have to start from a place of understanding what that is, or at least being curious about mm -hmm. what that might be. Right. right. And, and right. that's the best place to start. Okay, what do we say to an anxious, depressed, or stressed child about happiness? The chapter about happiness, by the way, was like one of my favorites. I love learning about happiness, and you guys wove it in beautifully. So what do we say about happiness? Well, you know, I, uh, I was lecturing in Houston about the self-driven child uh, right before the pandemic. And I asked this group of student, these high school student leaders who, um, uh, and, uh, I said, how many of you want to be happy as adults? And they all kind of sheep, they go, duh, they kind of sheepishly <laughs> raised their hand. And I said, well, what do you understand about what it takes to be happy as, as an adult? And this one kid, you know, he kind of said, well, we understand that if you get into a good enough college, everything else is set. Mm. And as, as Ned has pointed out, if that were true, students at Yale would be the happiest people on the planet, and yet they're among the most miserable. Yeah. And, and what we realize is, it, and, and you know, we're, we saw, we noticed that, that so many colleges now offer these classes on happiness. And the, 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 the Yale's class on happiness taught by Laura Santos is the most popular course in the history of Yale University. And we got to start, to th we started thinking, why do we need to wait until to, to, to they go to college for them to really tell them, here's, here's, what, here's what we know about what makes people happy. And it's not- Wait until they're miserably unhappy before we teach <laughs> that, them how to be right. happy. That's <laughs> right, yeah. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not what you think. We're terrible yeah. predictors of what makes us happy. And, and so it's not that we, it's not that we want to, you know, kids have, have to have a smiley face. Again, we want to acknowledge their feelings, whatever they are. We want them to, to be able to experience their feelings and talk about them. But we, we want to set the bar higher than just trying to, to try to minimize anxiety and depression. We want to set the bar thinking, why, why is it that kids can't be happy? Why is it that they can't be joyful? Why don't we, we, we apply what we know about what makes people happy to, to, to our raising our kids and educating our kids, as opposed to kind of perpetuating this crazy, crazy, crazy idea that all that matters is your achievement. So that's so uh, we, we do have this chapter about what do we, what do we know about happiness and how do we talk to kids about it in a way that they can give them a little bit more sane and a little bit more accurate understanding of if you want to be happy here's what you do yeah yeah I feel like this is one of those like like if I could design a school system <laughs> you know it would teach like how to pay taxes and it would teach like here's what we know about happiness. Like this would be one of those basic yeah. things. And yet so many of us are, we don't know like what, like we believe it's like, oh, just, it's just behind that next Amazon purchase or it's just behind that right, next, right. <laughs> if my kid could just get that degree, like then our whole family would be happy. Like, but that's, what do we actually know about happiness? Like what makes us happy? Well, we, we love the work of Martin Seligman, uh, who really founded the, the the study of positive psychology. So rather than like you know how do how do we mitigate misery, how, how do <laughs> what, what do you know what do happy, successful, thriving individuals look like? And so the the acronym that he uses is PERMA, and it stands so P is positive emotions. And so you know some people more glass half full and some glass half empty. But also you know it's cognitive behavioral therapy and, and mantras and gratitude practice and all these kind of things that actually change those positive emotions. E is engagement or the flow experience. And so this is you know being deeply involved in things sometimes out, outside of school. You know of, of sports and music and art and Legos and whatever. Um, R is relationships. M is meaning. Um, being connected with something, you know, bigger than yourself. And then A is the accomplishment or achievement. And it's, it's not that we don't get pleasure from, you know, winning an award, winning a game, you know, getting into the college of our dreams, you know, more money, you know, professional rewards, blah, blah, blah. It's just that that's one fifth of the whole equation. And mm. whoa, whoa, whoa to the family or person who sacrifices four out of five of those for achievement, 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 achievement. 
because so often they then get, they, they achieve everything they think they need or they think will make them happy. And they can end up being really miserable and then looking around like, but I've done everything. I've won everything. What else am I supposed to do? <sighs> and we want, look, I mean, I'm a guy who spent almost 30 years helping kids, you know, get into colleges and, and there are wonderful advantages to going to these, these, these best quote unquote best schools. It's just simply that you don't have to. Yeah, <laughs> you know, go it's to not the one path. Thankfully, right? yeah. it's, it's a want, not it's a want, not a need. And there are so many to re reference what Bill mentioned before. There are so many people who sacrifice everything, you know, inc including their own, you know, mental health to get into these places, and then they're unhappy. And and we want people uh, when they're when they're when they achieve what they want and they're successful, to be able to enjoy that success. And so, so for us, it's really a model of, of one, what's, what, what are the con, con, uh, constituent parts of a happy life? And also, how do we do it in a way that's sustainable? Yes. Okay. What do we say if our kid is on technology in such a way that we see that their well-being, like mood and sleep, et cetera, is suffering? Get off. I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't even know what you're doing on there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Are you gaming again? God, that's such a right. stupid waste of time. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so you know, it, it's kind of it, it's pretty simple for us in, in the sense that you know, we, in, in both of our books, we talk about this idea of as kids get older, think about yourself as a parent more as a consultant than, than as your kid's boss or manager. What the goal is, the kid learns how to the, the kid is able to run his own life before he goes off to college. And this, this, this is the goal that we're, that we're suggesting that families, the parents set. I, I want my kid to be able to run his own life before I send him off to, 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 to college or, or to do whatever, you know, send him off to do whatever when, when he leaves home. And so many kids that we see, they simply aren't, aren't, aren't ready to do that because they, they haven't had enough experience really managing their own lives. They've, they've been focused on jumping through hoops as opposed to taking responsibility for, for uh, their things. So you know, there, there are kids who are wired in a way where um, they just can't stop thinking about uh, uh, video games or, or, or social media. Yeah, you know, th th those kids probably need therapy. But for the most part, what we want to do is we want to, we, we want to, again, try to understand. For kids who play video games, we want, we want to play with them, sit and, and watch them do it to try to under, let them respectfully show them why they love this stuff so much. Because if we take that kind of attitude, it's much easier for, for if we say, God, I can, see, I can see why you love this. God, I, I, I just notice how much more confident you are. I see how much fun you have with your friends. I, I, I get wh wh why you love this stuff. And also, I, I just, I, I, I'm a little concerned that it seems like if you spend you know, more than a couple hours at it, you know, you're pretty irritable. I wonder if there's a way that we could work, we could work together to figure out a schedule so you could still love, get, do the stuff you love but it wouldn't affect your mood so much. I think we're just much more able to influence kids in a healthy way to make good decisions if we take this kind of perspective. Yes, yeah. I absolutely agree. I, like I remember in our last episode mentioning one of my favorite like sentence starters is like, I'm noticing and I'm wondering, and I find this really helpful in the technology yeah. conversation with my kids. Cause I can yeah. say like, I'm noticing that when you're doing, if this, if, when you choose this activity after dinner, you don't get enough sleep. You seem the next day seems to be really hard for you and not as enjoyable. Like, have you noticed that? And like, do you, I'm wondering if you have any ideas about it. Like I'm, I'm open to like what ideas you have about it. And, and then, and then having the attitude of, well, let's just try it. Let's try it and see what happens. Like having that sort of experimental mm, mm. A, a piece component to it. I find really helps me and my kids to be willing to like, we don't have to be a hundred percent in love with the idea to just try it and see what we learn, you know, about the effects that it has. On us. Yeah. And I, I would add to that, you know, that, that particularly when there, there are some parents who feel like it's their job to control their kids use of technology because the effects of them, uh, of this technology can be so negative. And, and we're concerned about those too. Yeah. But from our perspective, my job as a parent is not to control my kid's use of technology, but to help him learn to control it for himself. Because if, if it's really about my power, 
then then he's only safe as long as I can, you know, keep him under control. But you know, again, my kid, you know, I, I, we, we, even when he well, there's a story in the book when he's a sophomore, and even then, I'm thinking he's a couple years away from heading off to some far flung college with suitcases <laughs> full of my money, and I have zero ability to control. So let's not yeah. set set ourselves up for that, you know, fraud experiment. But yeah. by working with him, you know, and and being respectful, and, and I love the way that you described that, Rachel. It allows us to not try to exert power, but rather to have influence. So there's a story in the book that I so I so enjoyed this experience that was hard at the time. My son in his sophomore year, the game Fortnite came <laughs> through our household like a plague, <laughs> right? A really fun woohoo for him, but his parents were looking just like, oh my gosh, right? <laughs> And he had this day off from school. He had a Friday off of school. And so on Thursday night, I was asking him, so what, what, what are your plans for tomorrow? And I'm hoping, <laughs> foolishly thinking, hoping he'll say, I'm going to clean my room. He's like, no, no, I'll play Fortnite. And I, and I look at him like, uh, okay, any, <laughs> anything else? He's like, hmm, I'll think about it. I'm like, oh, geez. Okay, fine. So I say nothing. I come home on Friday afternoon. It's on at six o'clock. There's my kid, my wonderful son in front of the computer, still playing Fortnite, mind you, in his pajamas. I admit to being a little hot. I do. I admit to being a little hot. And I said, and I sort of look at him, kind of purse my lips and said, can you finish, you know, win, die, don't really care, but finish because I would like to go out for pizza. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, my, my, Matthew's a really easy going guy. And so he, you know, he wins. He, I don't even know. He finishes. Um, we, we all go off and have dinner and have a perfectly lovely time. I calm down. And then I say nothing more. And then Saturday, I say nothing more. Sunday, I say nothing more. Until <laughs> right around five o'clock when if you have ever been a teenage boy or been the parent of one, you know, it's pretty much the witching hour when he realizes, oh, dang, tomorrow's Monday. I do have homework. <laughs> now he's kind of stressed. He's upset with himself. Like, oh, I can't believe I wasted the whole day Friday playing. Home. Why didn't I do some of my homework on Friday? If ever there were parental, ha ha, I told you, so why did you, you know, this was it. It was just, I mean, he gave it to me on a silver platter, but there's this book. So it felt like that was the wrong way to reply. So I looked at him and I said, I know what that feels like. Cause that's, I been there, done that. I said, can I ask a question? He says, sure. I said, do you know, do you know roughly how many hours you think you spent playing Fortnite on Friday? He's like eight, 10, maybe wow. Was it fun? Oh yeah. We won like four times. It was awesome. Great. Um, another question though, if you had to, like how many hours would have been necessary to really get your Fortnite fixed, but not feel like you, you know, air quotes was wasted your whole day. And he's like, mm, maybe four or five. One more question in the future. Would it help you if mom or I could, could kind of help you manage your use of technology? Yeah, I think that'd be really good. And now, as we talk about in the book, now we had buy-in. So we could offer help. We could offer, you know, I know you got that paper you're trying to do and, you, and something, your phone keeps blowing up. Would it help you if we kept your phone for an hour and a half just so you can really keep your head down and focus on your work? Yeah, that'd be great. Or no, I'm, I'm waiting, you know, for Samuel to text me because we're working on this project together. And it, and it really gave us an opening to, to kind of step into being a kind of technology consultant. Yes. And, you know, he went to college. He's 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 a kid with the ADHD who loves video games and particularly loves playing with his friends on video games. But he also managed to get through his first year of college, and I will say, got more A's as an ADHD kid with Xbox, mind you, <laughs> in one year of college than I got in at least my first two, maybe first three. I mean, he did a brilliant job. Oh. Was he sleep deprived and playing more video games than I would have chosen? Yeah, but you know what? As Bill said. Whose life is it? Whose problem is it? Whose responsibility? His, his, and his. But because we really walk this walk of trying to be consultative, he would still actually ask us and, and constantly tell us about, oh, I'm reading this and reading that and, and trying this and trying that because we want our kids to struggle with these problems, to find solutions that work for them. Because what is life but doing that for every problem that matters? Oh, yes. Thank you for giving us such a beautiful example. I loved every single thing about it. And hopefully people can go back and like listen to that little bit over and over because I know I get asked about technology a lot. I know one time my my kid was on technology for what what felt like a really long time to my husband. And he kind of unloaded on this kid. And then the kid just calmly looked up at him and said, 
if you want to, if, if your need is that you want to spend more time with me, you can just tell me and I'm happy to turn it off and spend time with you. <laughs> oh, Isn't it ouch. so wonderful when in any situation, there's at least one person acting like an adult? Uh, oh man. It's like, oh, okay. This is some, like, oh, what an amazing moment. Like, and my husband just, you know, his whole face just like broke into a smile. And he was like, oh yes, you guys are what amazing. A great, Lesson What learned. a great kid. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yes, oh my goodness. Yes. One of those like rewarding parenting moments again, like, cause even if we don't get it right a hundred percent of the time, like that example happened to be my husband, but like, I don't get it right a hundred percent of the time to have your kids reflect back, like all the times that you do get it right to where yeah. you're looking at, like, what's this person's real need in this moment, even if they're kind mm. of coming at us a mess. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're unfulfilled. Yeah. 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 Right. Unfulfilled. Right, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, the show notes can be found at sagefamily.com slash podcast 66, where you can also subscribe and get future show notes sent right to your inbox. So what are your favorite resources for people to dive deeper into this topic? And of course, we have your new book, What Do You Say?, which I will link to in the show notes, though it's not released, right? Yet, when does it come out? It comes out this Tuesday, August 17th. So oh, okay, anyone good. who's so inclined, when, when does this, this conversation drop? Uh, soon. I'm not exactly <laughs> sure it's off of my head, but it will be out. It's not going to be out before Tuesday. So okay. it's perfect because I'll be well, able to link to it. I'll tell you this. So we are, uh, um, we are working really, really hard to try if we can. We'd love everyone's help. If, you're, if, if you think you'd like to buy the book, if, they can, if there's any possibility for folks to buy it up through Monday the 23rd. That's what counts for us to, to try to get all the you know bestsellers yeah. listed in New York Times and all this kind of stuff. And so we were pretty darn close to the first book and we have we have way more even more friends now than we did then including <laughs> that fabulous Rachel Rainbow. <laughs> so uh, um, so that would be that that would be our our, our beseeching humble ask. I can um, definitely and, help you appease the algorithm gods. I will post it on my <laughs> social media. <laughs> You're I an angel. Will. I will review it. I will definitely help in this endeavor. And you recommend some great books in this book too, I'll say. Oh, like I, I had like highlighted a bunch of them and I'd read a bunch of them and kind of forgotten about them and thought, oh yeah, that's a great recommendation. So people who read your book and who want to like sort of dive deeper and learn more, they reference a lot of really great books inside their book too. And I'll tell you, you know, we are not foolish enough to think that we have, you know, have have all the wisdom about parenting, you know, and so hence all these other other experts that, that we mentioned, as you, as you so kindly point out. But we also know that all of all of your listeners as parents have all kinds of wisdom to share with their kids. And the whole point of this book is a huge part of this book is not the what, but the how because we want all of us as parents to be effective in communicating important messages of, of how to navigate life successfully, of values that are important. And we want to be effective in that. And so this book is really about the how of that. Um, so we have this close connection so that, that we can feel heard and our kids can feel heard too. Oh, beautiful. Thank you guys so much, Ned and Bill. You're gonna have to keep writing books so we have more excuses to have <laughs> conversations. So. We'll, next time we'll come back and we'll just trade recipes with Ray. It'll be great. We'll talk to you about anything, anytime. You're just, it's, it's, to, we so enjoy talking with you. Yeah, yeah. We, we love the way you think, Rachel. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you so much for this conversation. And we will get sharing every, with everybody about your book. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay.